had to feel torn. The bullies picked on me for the rest of the world to notice. My first therapist said it was ADHD, the one after that OCD. Now my current specialist that they'll need to look a little bit more closer. Am I on the wrong planet? At school I was invisible, but my grades refused to adopt a low profile even when I didn't study. Teachers loved to send me on errands. Maybe they figured I needed to be kept off the playground. There, no one picked me for their team. The school wanted them cool and popular. So well, when I got lucky, I'd be the goalkeeper. At home, my screen time was ruled out as odd. Mama serving chicken and I didn't like the smell. I'm also not exactly daddy's girl. My friends, they termed them as misfits. At church, I played dumb to get through the service. At the mall, I learned to endure the retailer's fake smiles. Do you know that feeling when you're playing hide and seek and think to yourself, what if I don't come out? What if this is it? I don't usually envy other vertebrates, but because I need to grow a backbone, I envy frogs for their hibernation prowess, squirrels for stocking up for tough times, and elephants for their respect from the king of the jungle. All I have hugged is being a chameleon. Have I mentioned I broke up with Jim? Wait, dumped by Jim, dumped. After four years, all he said was his friends had a point. I remember staring at the door shut in my face. I medicated with food for a fortnight. Then I bumped into this novel, a thick, good book, and I got lost in it. No, found. Then I met Seth, and Seth wanted babies, but I asked him who's gonna mother them. So now I'm single all over again, my sanity on the line. I wrote on almost all the remaining pages of my diary that evening. At dinner, he had gently asked, can we be just friends? I can't be friends with the whole world, can I? Then I remember being back to bed, a pen in my hand. I needed to write some things off, but it was as if I was writing on the seabed, my words being washed away by some salty water above room temp. If only my recent interview had paid off, I would have had a good steerage drowning out the chaos in my head. Music gives me wings. My brain gives me no break. A little discomfort and the sins play over and over again. The should-haves, should've said this, should've done that, ah! Should I plaster my face, my face with bumper stickers for the rest of the world to give me sympathies? I thought I didn't belong anywhere, really. Then I met the www.this.that. Thank God for this space. Online friends, online shopping, online worship, online interviews, jobs, music, ebooks, blogs, ads, uh, dating. Should we add online marriages too? Hi, my name is Sarah Bosibori Bitange, uh, a self-advocate, a self-autistic advocate. Um, I am a former ambassador, Light of Autism Kenya 2019 to 2020. Um, I work at Iris Neurosoul Cafe. Um, I love all things that are uh, storytelling sort of like film series i love making um friends i love laughing because laughing is what makes um what makes life go go on makes you happy um yeah that's basically me and a lot of a lot more things Okay, my first diagnosis, I was in class six. Um, this is after realizing that I had so much of learning dif difficulties. Um, I didn't know how to read, that to write was a problem. Um, concentration in class was, it was a lot. Um, yeah, that was like the first time and I thought I myself wasn't aware that I had autism. I was told that I was just different from others. So back then we didn't have like proper therapies to come and give us like an assessment. Um, but our teachers had a bit of knowledge about like special needs. Um, so I was through now um, the learning difficulties is when they discovered I have autism. That's when I was transferred to a special unit in that school. It was a Kawaida normal school. Um, I spent, uh, I think, was it a few months? Then that's when I transferred to a special school. Before now going to a special, special school. Uh, it's, it's a long journey. You have to 
um, I guess, locate where special schools are. And uh, in the early 2000s, it was really hard to get some of these schools. So we had to go as far as Meru to look for a special school. Um, um, okay, I can't really tell of what exactly the, the reactions, because I was still tiny. Yes, the bullying came along with it. Uh, the, pe the, the people who didn't really want to understand or be considered that I am a different kind of child. So that happened. And I think the whole transition of being not aware that you have the condition because before therapy um, you're still progressing and you're 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 taught to like um, how do I say I can't really explain because it's um, it's it's I think a miracle for me to actually be as expressive as I am today than before um, eh, that's, I think it's <laughs> it's it's really um, it's really a complex thing to talk about, but yeah, it's it's it is a long transition from just being having the, all the signs and uh, for for that person or the therapist to perfect it in a way that almost almost all people think I don't have autism, of which I always am intrigued because I'm like, eh, was I really struggle? Because even right now when we're doing this, I have anxiety, but it's just because I have my coping mechanisms, and yeah, I think that's basically it. Um, yes, yes, um, it's basically like normal life where you're having like a whole lot of challenges um, as an individual where you're trying to figure yourself out. Now for me, um, I would really like have so many meltdowns and um, through my therapy, it, okay, it's, it's a, it was a disadvantage at some point to, I would say it's like I was um, taught to be a, a sort of like a robot of which I think everyone gets that saying of where like society makes you want to, makes you someone you're not really. So for me as a person living with autism, yes, my therapy helped me enough, but there's this masking, you know, masking you that you have to be someone like the other person uh, like so for me i can say i did a bit of research of which was really hard because i had to go through depression i had to go through um suicidal thoughts and just having a few people in society understanding or like being considered hey you're different so it's okay to be different, but for me, it was really hard to accept that I'm different because um, I too transitioned from now the special needs um, into a normal mainstream u uh, university or institute. That's where like, okay, because I'm talent oriented. Um, that's the only thing that saved me uh, after high school because my strengths was in arts, so I could draw, I could paint, and I could sing as well. So, um, so I decided to choose art, uh, drawing and painting. I did a short course in uh, drawing and painting in Buruburi Institute of Fine Arts. And then, because I didn't know I would actually achieve it, I cleared. Then I was like, hey, I see I can actually do the diploma. So, you know, certificate isn't as 
um, as challenging and it's just like a short course is just a short course like there is no wide and it's not pressure pr pressured you don't I mean you don't do things pressurized um, so I tried the diploma for like a year it was stressful I could not know like um, okay they say women can multitask better than men but having autism you can't multitask as much it was a mess for me but um, it's I think for me it's still I still go through that trauma because it's it was something that I really loved um, I wanted to venture like and complete my diploma uh, but because of all pressures uh, my anxiety and me trying not to be myself um, just you know uh, basically being uh, normal of which I don't think everyone is normal in this world we all we all have our own, uh, our own craziness um, so I went through depression I had suicidal thoughts uh, I just wanted to end it all so I had to drop out of school I was I was helped by my sisters. Uh, I was seeking for um, uh, a help group, a support group, um, where I got to know some parents who have children with autism and therapists as well. Um, that made me feel like I wasn't alone. Um, I also ha I googled a few groups that have people living with autism like myself um, till date uh, I'm very grateful for that because if I didn't have that I think I wouldn't have progressed in life as the way I'm progressing um, which I'm managing a group in Africa called Africa Autists and I think it's one of my biggest accomplishments um, to bring like a community together so that we we don't feel alone like everyone is okay with their space um, now going through that I also entered a pageant of which I never knew I would ever win um, it was Mr. Light Mr. and Miss Autism Kenya 2019 to 2020 so I went to audition for that I auditioned I trained went through the whole training and yes guess people never knew I was autistic just they knew that I had like physical challenges so um, the trainer asked about it and she was told by another lady who was part of the organization that I was volunteering and I also was representing as light of autism Kenya um, she told uh, the trainer that I'm autistic everyone was like shocked we had four ambassadors so two of which are supposed to be our voices um, uh, as persons living with autism we're like a few that can express ourselves so there's the non-verbal autistic and the verbal autistic now i happen to be verbal um, and so they had like two that can actually be our voices and then now ourselves were raising awareness um, uh, for autism because we live with the with the condition we represent our strength our weaknesses of now being the the people we are uh, yeah so that came I became light of autism Kenya for like two years now during my my time I had a lot of projects that I did. Um, I was invited to Morocco to just to represent Kenya in uh, in an event where it was also an autistic event where people come and present the, the talents they have. Um, I also personally wrote to True Love um, about uh, just raising awareness as women because there was me uh, a friend of mine called Karen 
and another lady called Abby. So we joined together, we're like, hey, let's just raise awareness in such a big way and in a women's magazine. So that happened. I think that was like my second biggest achievement. Now the third one was being uh, chosen to talk in a panel of uh, persons living with autism uh, on World Autism Day. And it was a UN, um, it was a live UN uh, conference, I would say. So yeah, that was like my biggest accomplishment. Oh, so currently I'm working at Ira's Neurosoul Cafe, a very amazing, nice ambiance, like the, the environment there is really therapeutic. It's a restaurant run by different individuals living with neurological conditions. There's dyslexia, cerebral palsy, autism, Down syndrome, uh, and the legs. So each of our table has like a book um, and a menu. So each book represents a neurological condition and probably stories, um, experiences with parents, ex uh, parents who have experienced their child and uh, how they cope uh, how to cope uh, with some challenges. Um, this is like self-help books, um, biographies, um, just basically something that can educate society about neurological conditions and how to better their lives, basically, yeah. Um, I, I would say, I think recognition, recognition, recognition for persons living with neurological conditions exactly from scratch, from primary school, going to secondary, going to tertiary institutes, going to everywhere, like it should be instilled in the system, like the way we know maths, geography, science, you know, basically, it should be within our schools, uh, at work. We should know, like, the different... Uh, we should be allowed to know different types of humans in, in society. Recognition, just to be seen, just to be known that we can be people in society because I never knew I would earn through, through uh, the place I'm working at. Uh, I never knew I would be this independent. So if I can be that, everyone can. El everyone else that has my condition can. They can be like that. Um, uh, being considerate and knowing that each uh, each one of us are different and have our strengths. So our strengths are the ones that make us who we are in society. Yeah, that's basically it. Uh, my name, as I, have, I had said earlier, is Jane Wamboy Kemani, a mother of three. Uh, my first born is Wangeshi, my second born is Kenya here, and my third born is Neema. Uh, I got Kenya in the year 2003. Uh, to go back a little bit, I had asked for a, for a, to, for a vacancy at Kise to do a course in inclusive learning. So I was admitted to Kise in 2002, August, while I was two months pregnant of Kenya. Uh, the pregnancy was okay. I can't complain of anything that happened during the pregnancy. But I used to be very much afraid because after learning what causes disability, I was afraid that now I was expecting a child and I didn't know what kind of a child I would get.
So Kenya was delivered a normal child and grew normal birth. And he acquired his first milestones very well. At eight months, he started his first words like mom, dad, and we progressed well. He was a very jovial child, but I could notice that he was shy. He was not able to look at anybody direct into the eyes. So we thought it was shyness. In 2006, I took Kenya for daycare, a baby class that is. And after like two months, the teachers complained that Kenya's hands were not very active, that they needed me to do, to, to practice a lot of activities using the hands with him. Uh, I got it and I was still in denial that there is something that needs to be done. So I started doing those activities like modeling, having him hold some heavy things to see whether he could have that grip. Uh, in 2007, I decided to take him for assessment. I went to Kise and I was told that uh, he had delayed developmental milestones which he would achieve in time if I was patient. So I went back home and became very patient. I waited. And after one year, I went to Kenyatta to see a psychiatry at this time, who after some assessment told me that my child has possible autism, could possibly be suffering from autism. Uh, this one was a great hit back. Since I knew what autism is, I, I knew the journey. So the first thing that hit me was denial. I denied. And uh, I went looking for help from other sources. Some could not tell. We were made to go through tests in hospitals. And every doctor said that this boy was okay and he would be able to overcome whatever it is as he grows. I went back to Dr. Omondi in 2009 and here we sat, in fact I took a lot of time with her and we agreed that Kenya was to start his therapy. That was late 2008. We agreed he was to start his therapy, occupational therapy, and I was also to change his diet. So we were advised on what Kenya needs to take. It was very difficult, but I decided that now I have to take the horn, the bull by the horns. I have to face this and my son has to overcome these barriers that seemed to hinder his learning, his social life and everything. So we changed the diet. Uh, we also started therapy at Kenyatta Hospital. And I also looked for a private therapist whom I used to see twice a week. And the journey seemed a little bit difficult, but I had friends who really encouraged me. The friends, the doctors that I met, the therapists that I met, they all told me that in his case, uh, we were in the right path because we had started it early and we might achieve a lot before he hits 15. Uh, so I continued with the therapy, I continued with the diet, uh, I continued with the supplements. I, I, was, I just decided to put him on supplements that would uh, modulate or boost his brain power. And I could see improvement because his one word, one word speech developed into a sentence. He also became a little bit calm. He was now not very hyperactive. He was not jumpy. I also decided to withdraw him from uh, family, from relatives, because I did not like the comparison that was being done. I did not like it at all. We could go home and uh, my nephews and nieces who are younger than him could be able to do certain activities that Kenya could not be able to do. So everybody would comment, ah, uyu mtoto haezi fanya hivi na vide ni mkubwa na hawa wegina wanamushida. So I decided instead of going through this, 
let us have uh, our families now that is Kenya and Wangeshi. I used to copy what the doctors, uh, what the therapists were doing and come and do it at home. And we continued and every time I could see progress, every time I could see progress. So by the time he was eight years, Kenya spoke his first sentence. We woke up one morning, I was preparing to go to school, <coughs> excuse me, and he just told me that, Pam, you are very slow. You're going to make me late for school. I'm going to leave you. And I told him, <coughs> just leave me. He picked his bag, went to the gate, and by the time I got to the gate, the bus was already there and he had been picked and gone to school. I shed tears of joy that day, knowing that one of the barriers had been cleared. Now we have speech. This speech continued, it never went back. It continued and he spoke only English and a lot of good English. And even though sometimes it could not make sense whatever he was saying, I as the mother and the immediate family members understood him very well. So later I decided instead of going to Nairobi for therapy, instead of fighting for schools in Muranga, why don't I go to my employer and ask for the transfer to Nairobi where I can be able to praise him in a school where we have autistic learners and go nearer to the therapists and maybe have some support group because in Muranga, I think in the whole of Muranga town, I was the only parent with a child with autism. And most of the parents and most of my friends thought that I have really pampered the boy, he's naughty. Uh, they associated his behavior with uh, bad parenting. Most of them also were very supportive. They used to call him my hardback because everywhere I went, I was with Kenya. If I went to the salon, we are together. If I went to the bank, we are together. My transfer to Nairobi came. And this one, this one made me so happy because now I knew that Kenya would get a school that would accept him. Uh, Kenya would have access to therapy because the, most of the therapists were based in Nairobi. And I would also have a, a group of parents that we can be able to share what we go through together. So we came to Nairobi and we pressed him in a class for learners with intellectual challenges and all went well until they decided Kenya now can be integrated to the regular school that is the age-based curriculum. Uh, he was integrated in pre-unit, he moved to class one, moved to class two, moved to class three. During all this time we had a lot of challenges because sometimes he felt like he was so big learning with those small small learners and he would ask me, Mom, what do you think I'm doing with those small children in class? I used to encourage him and tell him that uh, we are going to look for a better school for him. And we only need the basics that he can be able to read his name, he can be able to write his name, he can even be able to know the names of the other people. And mostly he can be able to know where he is. In this Nairobi, you cannot have a child who cannot tell direction. At least he can be able to tell you, Mama, I'm, I'm at Buruburu, come for me. This is really, really what I wanted. Not the KCPE, that he sits for KCPE, as most of the administrators in the public primary schools think. When we ask for integration, they think that our t children will uh, tamper with the minister that is score, and they don't want this kind of learners in their, in their age-based set up. So I just wanted my, my, my son to know where he is, uh, to know what is happening around him and just the basics uh, before we move now to maybe a course that he can do that can maybe be able to sustain him later in life because you never know. I don't know for how long I am here. So he continued until 2019, in 2020. I decided now it's time we look for a school that can give my my son something that he can do. They identify maybe what he likes most and uh, train him on the same. 
So we took him to a school in Nembu in uh, January 2020. Then Corona came. We were not able, they were not able to do much. So the, we can say that this is the second year that he's in that school. I cannot really tell what is happening because they always tell us that they want to follow. They want to follow, uh, they want to follow his, uh, his, his, his desire. Whatever he wants to do, they want to follow it and maybe come and build on it later. So we are still waiting. Although at times as a parent, you feel like you are being wasted at times because you want your son also to move fast. He's now 19. I wanted at least by the time he's 20, I know what he, he can do in life so that I can place him somewhere. I don't feel like all is lost because uh, the milestones that he has achieved since uh, he was diagnosed are something to be proud of. A child who could not hold a spoon to feed himself, a child who could not bathe himself, a child who could not even be able to relate with the other children in the estate or maybe in school, now has friends. Sometimes he even tells me that he has a, a girl who is a friend. And I really appreciate that as a mother because we want them to go through what other sons are going through. We want them to have a normal life. And we pray that one day it will happen. This one can only happen if we have inclusion. And what is inclusion? Some people think that having these children uh, in schools, having them in church and everywhere, that is inclusion. It is not yet inclusion until you appreciate whatever they do, you motivate them in whatever they do, and you participate in whatever they do. Otherwise, if you sit on the fence and then throw them somewhere in a field and you tell us that we are doing inclusion, uh, we are not yet there. We want them included everywhere. If I send my son to the market and uh, he doesn't know how much money he has spent buying the stuff that I had sent him, the seller should be in a position to know that this boy cannot be able to tell how much he has spent and how much balance he needs. So I will be very, I will practice my integrity and give him back the balance that he needs and pack him whatever he had been sent. We want even the matatu clue to know that these guys exist so that if he boards a matatu and he doesn't know the direction of where he's going, they will not laugh at him and say, ah, mtu mkubwa kama wewe unashidwa kujua kwendu kwani wewe unaishi aje ama ulisomea wapi. Those are the terminologies that are used everywhere. Yatu wena ni mkubwa, bona hujui kwenu wena ni mkubwa, bona hujui kufanya hivi. We would like to have a society that looks at them and knows what is happening to them and stands in the gap. Sometimes I always ask myself, who will stand in the gap? In the government, in the churches, everywhere in the society, who will stand in the gap? That any time uh, we have a, a person who has an intellectual disability, everybody understands them. Now we are only left as parents to understand our children. We have to be there for them every now and then. We have to keep on studying in the gap. What if I'm not there today because I don't know how much I have, how much time I have left? Who will be there for him? Who will accept that Kenya can work for him? Who will accept that Kenya can do so much if he has the right backup? We also need our family members to know that these children can survive. I have had occasions whereby somebody asks for my daughter for a birthday and they would only tell me uh, birthday. 
So where is Kenya left? Tunataka wangeshi atupeleke mahali fulani. So where is this boy left? That is what I call inclusion, acceptance and inclusion. Because if he th- if Kenya knows that you accept him, he will be able to manage himself because he knows that you have confidence in him. But if you don't have confidence in him, he'll also not have confidence in, in himself. Anytime another lauli wanamtu, unapata ata confidence yake imeenda chini. Self esteem yake imeenda chini. Huyu mtu hata kuna kitu alikuwa anaweza kujifanyia ameshindwa kujifanyia kwa sababu he already now knows that uh, there is somebody who knows that he cannot be able to do this or that so that is what we uh, really need and we also need the government to come in and come up with uh, institutions that can really really grow their talents because these guys are talented some of them can sing others are very very talented in IT but any time you take him to maybe a training center they will ask you did he do KCP so they believe that until somebody writes a national exam they cannot be able to do any any course which to me i don't think it is the case when we were going to school we had people who could not even write their own names and today they are very good mechanics others are very good dressmakers others are very good they can do a lot of things so we don't need to take them through the national exams kcp kcsc so that they can move to the next level we need a setup where whereby they believe in that talent i taught some two boys somewhere in moranga who could not be able to perform anything they were not getting anything in school and sometimes teachers felt like the twins should not be in school then i told them even if they are not supposed to be here let us push them until they do class 8 after class 8 these guys like repairing radios radios torches you would see them repairing these things if you leave your torch and they see the torch the next moment you see the torch it is like in 15 parts and it will be brought together and it would work so after they did class 8, I think their mother took them to a person who trained them more on these repairs. And these boys, believe it or not, if you go to a shopping center called Gasharagaini in Mathioya constituency of Moranga, they are radio repairers, TV repairers. They have a shop somewhere. So if we could only have somebody who believes in our children, if we could only have uh, facilities, facilities that have been set up by the government because the private facilities are very expensive. I have had so many that I would like my son to go through, but I cannot afford it. A facility that is charging 100,000 per term. Even if I want, I cannot be able to afford it. We have gone through a lot, through his therapies, through his diet, through the supplements, that right now, I don't think we can be able to do much, but if there was a government institution that was taking care of them and we have uh, people who have the skills, the technical teachers have been placed there, our children can be trained at a very small fee, just like the fee we pay for the others in colleges. But I don't understand why. When it comes to people with a disability, their services are expensive. Some people say, that uh, these children are given to the rich. That is not true. It is not true at all. They drain us and they leave us sometimes financially disabled. But we thank God because they are there. Uh, This boy has been a source of joy. He is a person who loves people. He appreciates even the small things that you do for him. Anytime we cook and he knows that I'm the one who cooked, he'll appreciate the meal. He'll also appreciate the aunt's meal. Uh, sometimes he even sits and tells me, thank you, mom, for the way you have taken care of me. I thank God that now I can be able to do this and this. He remembers what he was not able to do and thanks me for what he is able to do. Above all, we put God first. It is God, not me. God guided me in uh, taking him through this uh, journey 
we don't know how long it will take we don't know what is awaiting us we don't know how much we need but all i know is that kenya one day will be a father somewhere will be a husband of somebody and my lineage will continue through him and through the other children Uh, my name is Anna Ngasa. I live in Kilifi, Kenya. I'm also the Kushite girl, my stage name for my poetry is I do spoken word. The one I just did was Alienated, which I did last year for the Autism Awareness Day, World Autism Day for the Autism Awareness Month. Um, I'm now currently an autism self-advocate. Since learning that I was autistic, which has completely explained my life, so now I do advocacy and um, sadly we still, we still sit at awareness because there is ignorance and with ignorance comes stigma. So this is how I came into advocacy. Uh, the theme this year is inclusion in the workplace. But let's talk a little bit about inclusion even out here, even in families, because we know everyone has a place where they get to, to stem from. That is our, our families. Um, like for parents, you've, you've, you've listened to parents of autistic children. Uh, they usually like sort of speak for them sometimes or uh, just treat them as babies, even when they're 16 and 21. So yeah, like for inclusion, I'd say, learn to just let people, let us be, let us, let us be like other human beings, you know, move on with the stages. When someone is 12, 15, they are also teens. As much as they're autistic, they're also teens. And then when they move to adulthood, they're adults, even if they are autistic. So allow us to be. There's what we call um, infantilization, treating us as kids. You're treating someone as a kid even when they're 30, you know? And this usually irritates me. Like, just, just let us be, let us be. Um, when they watched my, my recent interview, I was like, okay, how should someone who's autistic look like? Because autism comes with comor comorbidities, that is other, other disorders or things like that that get to accompany autism, which someone doesn't get to see. Um, so number one, I'll say, uh, let people learn more about autism for us to have inclusion so that you know, uh, for this person, I might have to do this, adjust this and uh, adjust that. Because we're not saying, oh, we're autistic, we are disabled, let us stay in the house. No, we also want to work like, like the rest of the population. But there are those things that can be done even without really major, without really uh, like a lot of money being spent or major adjustments being made uh, that will make other people uncomfortable in the process. Uh, something like work, uh, I'll say, I don't know why people don't eye autistic, uh, autistics, I don't know. I, I'm yet to know why. Maybe they find us awkward or weird or just the word autism just throws someone off balance. But I can say autistics are good employees. They're really good employees. Uh, sometimes they're mistaken for workaholics. So that you find out an autistic is, uh, is at work even on an uh, unpaid overtime, yeah? So I don't know why people don't hire autistics. And uh, another thing, we are Tara, we are Tara, the kind of work we do, or let me say the kind of work I do when I'm at work. I just, I'm just Tara. I want to make sure that I've done everything so that nothing crops up, so that I'm called in, in another time that I'm doing something else or I'm focusing on something else. Like say if it's marking, marking exams, you want to mark as fast as you can and just be done with it and, and go to other things so that it's not like you're marking till last minute and then you have to organize last minute everything last minute yeah I'll say uh, like for last minute I find it hard because on top of autism I have ADHD so ADHD you know you get all these distractions yeah distractions and but but for me I find last minute doesn't work for me I have to do I have to, to, do, to do stuff in good time so that's why uh, just sudden sudden assignments are really very hard to do when you open the school you need something like a schedule you're told you're going to do this and do this and do that so that i know how things are going to flow and then i'll i'll schedule my time but but don't suddenly just you know uh come up with something last minute and i think 
we are a culture of last minute. I don't know if it's as a, as a country or just many organizations. We're just a culture of last minute. You find that January, February, March, you're just hanging around. And then all of a sudden, every, every other work needs to be done. So that can be hard for an autistic, you know. So why not just have that schedule? I know that people see it as useless, but it works for us, you know. By now, I think, you know, autism, um, autistics love structure. They love a structure so that they know after this we get here and we get there, yeah. Another thing I'll say, um, th they, are, they are like, I'll, I'll say, unnecessary traditions and routines in the workplace, you know. Um, I don't know, like office party. I, I, I am okay. Okay, it's an office party, fine, but we don't like have to stick till the very end of the, of the party. You can just say show up or even if you're not coming, it's fine. Let, send, let someone like, you know, um, represent you or can just let us just be there for the technical appearance. People do many technical appearances for many things. So why not something like an office party where you really don't know why you're there, you know, things like that. Um, I'll also say uh, some bosses are good with autistics because they don't focus on, they don't focus on the how, they focus on the end results. They're like, okay, Anne, you're going to do this and this and this. Uh, uh, and really once you're done, bring it to my office, something like that, for example. And then they don't like tell you, okay, when you get here, uh, take, take PowerPoint, do this, this, and then do this. Like, you know, sometimes when you break it down that much, you might give me a process that is going to be too difficult to do. So there are bosses who are like, give me the end results, how you do it, that's up to you. And you know, like people who have ADHD know that. They know that uh, when you're led to, to work on the how, then you become the expert there because we have like jobs that need creativity when when a job needs creativity you know you're not going to be told the how because if you're told the how then there is no room for you to to be creative so that's why i keep saying um allow us to to work on that on something that you think we are we are good at so that we can give the best we can give the best of our knowledge and skills but if you just choose to to say okay um we're going to do this, everyone is going to do this, or you're going to do this because this is the kind of work that I have scheduled for you. Then it becomes really hard, yeah? I find like jobs like where there's some sort of like rotation, where there's like rotation, like uh, this day this one is going to do this and then next week someone else is going to do that. That rotation kind of, it gets to a point where some are like sluggish. Like let's say for teacher on duty, um, I don't know. You find that the duties that are going to be really cool, that those ones that are going to be quiet, that those ones that kids are going to be really on their feet because of a certain teacher, you know, that's what I'm saying, like rotational, is going to be a different person, a different person, yeah? Things like that. Another thing is just respect, respect, respect us at, at, our, at uh, our workplace. For some reason, I, I, I got trained or uh, I got trained like someone else who is a neurotypical got to. So don't say that. I don't know how they are here, how they got that job. There is no way you can get a job you're not qualified for. I've never seen that. All I know is not getting a job that you're overqualified for. That one I know. Because sometimes, yeah, they just don't like you, so they won't give you a job, you know. Um, so another thing I'll say is, uh, as, you, as you give autistics jobs, you know, as you give autistics jobs, uh, or want to include them in your workplace. Look at the, look at the, the, the how you interview, you interview us, because some interviews can can really, can really make you make you don't know what to say or just get you off guard. Like uh, a friend was telling me, was it the other day? Uh, not yesterday, the other day. So he was telling me, uh, why why don't why don't you every time you go to an interview say make sure you say as a strength you can work under high pressure not like work under high pressure you sure won't be lying because one thing i know is uh, i i don't like pressure i don't i don't even right now living in kilifi is me moving moving from nairobi because that is high pressure anyone can tell you being in nairobi is high pressure it's the capital so i feel like i'll be lying but they're saying that is what you should say to get a job so I'll say how you interview us, how you interview us, our strengths. If you don't say high pressure, just know we can work. We are thorough. I I think every other every other school I've been, 
I've been known for over time. I just, I just look for, for a time to finish what I have not finished in regular time. And I don't ask for extra pay for that. Unless if there is a, there is a remuneration for something, then fine, remunerate me because you have scheduled for it. But usually I don't like go asking for it. Yeah, some schools will offer motivation for teachers, but I think if there is none for me, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be good because at the end of the day, uh, you get the satisfaction from your job place. Uh, another thing I'll say is uh, the, the patronizing that is at workplace for autistics. The one I'm saying infantilization from parents or from siblings or from friends, why they get to decide for you and think for you because they think, hey, you're autistic, these things you don't know. You know, there's what they call theory of mind. They say autistics are blind to, uh, to what people might be thinking of them. So they don't get the situation. They can't read the room, things like that for autistic. So um, I'll say, Patronizing uh, is so much in the workplace. Someone says, uh, Sasa wome kujajana, wome kujajana. We, have, we have been working here for the last 15 years. Yeah, you've been working there for the last 15 years. But I think someone must have given you room to, to get to that 15 years. They let, you, they let you work, they let you grow. But if you just want us to, uh, to lo sort of like live under your shadow at the workplace, you know, uh, if you were in our place, you wouldn't like to live under our shadow too. So I'd say uh, just give someone room to work because they got the job so that they could work, not so that they can get instruction after another, you know, uh, do this, do that, not like that, do it like this, you know. It's good just to give the corrections. I'm talking about patronizing where you're like wanting to take over everything for someone who has been employed in that uh, workplace. Um, patronizing, if you haven't gotten how I'm, I, I, I'm saying it, it's like sort of how nurses, how, how many, um, Male nurses get to be called uh, uh, get to be called doctors, and how many, and how female doctors get to be called nurses. You know, it's patronizing because you 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 just have this idea that oh, they're supposed to be a nurse, they're supposed to be a doctor. You know, so you think we are there, but we're not qualified. No, no, no. Everyone gets a job that they're qualified for. And then I'll say, uh, so treat us, treat us like you treat the rest. Yes, I'm autistic because I need some. I need some inclusion. I need some uh, some adjustments in the workplace. You know, adjustments in the workplace. Uh, maybe I need I need extra time to finish a task, or I need to come earlier than the normal time so that I, I'm able to work bef before colleagues come and catch up for like 30 minutes, and I'm and I lost and I lose the 30 minutes. You know, some workplaces can allow you to maybe wear your he head headphones so that you listen to like calm music as you work yeah as you work because you're going to get the job done many organizations are about the end product so i, I don't know why you don't allow some things that are going to just get us to the end product you know at the end of the day yeah i i, I ran a campaign last year where i was saying don't assume ask there's what you know about autism and autism gets to Autism gets to present differently in different people. So maybe the, the, the one that you've had, the person you know, is different from who I am, is different from someone else. Uh, from, from someone else. So you cannot just say, I, I think because she's autistic, she can't manage that, she, she won't be able to, they, they, they don't like noise, they don't like this, no, no, no. Maybe for me, I have learned how to cope with that because of maybe how I was brought up, the environment I live in currently, things like that. So just just don't conclude, don't conclude. And then uh, there's something like being being put off a job unfairly, you know. I just wake up one day and my job and my job is done. Like I don't know what I did, but you know, uh, I've been laid off just suddenly like that. Yeah. So I'll say uh, allow us to keep our jobs if we're doing what we are supposed to do. Uh, many jobs give warnings. If there's something that is really off, you can give warnings. Say, uh, you have a warning, you've been served with a warning because you did this, you did that, yeah. But don't just suddenly get someone off their job. They did not, no one plans to be out of work every morning they are going to work. That is the last thing that is on my mind when I'm, when I'm up going to school, that I'll find, I find someone calling me to the principal's office because my job is done, you know. So, Allow us to keep our jobs if you're doing what we're supposed to do. And then we cannot keep a job that you haven't given us. So I'm saying, uh, give us give us work. Give us work so that we're not a burden just because we're autistic. There is presentation of autism. There's us who can work 
uh, with minor adjustments. There are those ones who are going to work with uh, maybe considerable support, but we can work. Imagine if everyone just sat there, waited for someone to come and, you know, give them something at the end of the month because they're autistic. Tell me how many people would we have, yeah, uh, as dependents. And then uh, another thing with being autistic is where we, we're like peaceful people. We don't want trouble. We, we don't want fights and conflicts. So you find you're being forced to work uh, or maybe a project or an assignment that is not really yours. Some bosses just don't want to see you sit at desire or, uh, you know, you're, you're good, so it's your time. It's your time to like sort of uh, take a breather. So they'll come and say, ah, I see Anne that you, you, you're done. Why don't you help us with that and that and that, you know? You're being forced to work on other things. And they know maybe you're not good with that thing or it's someone else's work, so they're like taking it from them and giving it to you. And uh, it, is, it doesn't come with, um, doesn't come with, uh, with, with any, uh, maybe remuneration or any advantage to it, you know? Nothing, just like uh, they say, when you're a good employee, you get awarded with, with more work, yeah? And I was, I was making a joke and saying, I think I'll, I'll, I'll take a, a slow pace when I'm working on something so that I don't get awarded with more work. I think if someone is doing a good job, yeah, you're the, you're the best employee for, for that year. You needed to be given a vacation, you know, paid vacation or, uh, or something like that, or leave, or leave days. Like something else, a promotion, but when you're given more work because you're a good employee, I don't see how that is an, a reward. Okay, so there is this forced work, yeah. Like for me, I'm not good with, I'm not good with uh, like, uh, they call them the PR, they call them the PR jobs. I'm not, I'm not good with them. But you'll find your boss is taking you from, from being an office admin to a secretary, uh, again, to serving the guests. And you're thinking, uh-oh, this is going to be hard for me because there's that small talk and, and smiling and grinning, you know, things that you find very hard to do as, a, as an autistic, yeah. So I'll say, uh, I'll allow me know when I'm, when I'm getting a job, what's my job description? I don't want to wake up one morning and I'm supposed to be the one making tea. You never told me I'll be making tea when you're giving me this job. So suddenly, why am I making tea, you know? Let me know what I'm, I'm signing up for. I think that's why some people get scared of even, uh, of even applying to some, to some workplace because they're told, there, you're not even sure what is your job description. You're going to be doing many things at the same time. But because you don't have a job, why don't you try, you know? Many of the autistics are unemployed. That, that is not a secret, yeah? We're unemployed because, like I'm telling you, we, we miss what we're supposed to say in the interviews even if we are, we are qualified. And if, if you have a, a certificate of disability and then you have autism appear somewhere, someone might look at you, uh, you know, with a second eye, yeah? They look at you and then they're like, oh, Autistic, okay. So now they, they start treating you from that perspective that you're autistic, which I'm saying we are, forced, we are facing stigma because uh, there is there already the picture that we have of what autism is, uh, uh, which now we need to, to learn more. Now, now that we have the whole of every as, as Autism Awareness Month, we can, we can just learn something new about, about autism as we go. So, um, another thing uh, that I'll finish with is an uh, harassment at work, yeah? Like in school, we used to get bullies. We used to get bullies. Bullies would just pick on an autistic. I don't know. This, this people, it's like, uh, it's like they get to, it's like a magnet. They get to, to be attacked, to, to, to be attracted to, to an autistic. So they come, they get to bully you. You don't even know what you've done, what is making you stand out. Some things that would make you stand out, maybe things like braces. If you have braces, then uh, a bully thinks, okay, I can bully that because they have braces. So even at work, you have people who just like bully you because you're autistic. And now you're in an adult space. So here you're supposed to, yeah, you're supposed to fight for, you, for yourself, yeah? You're supposed to stand for yourself and, and stop the bully from whatever they're doing. Uh, I'll say at work, I track their, their guidelines, there is, there is code of ethics, code of conduct in the workplace. But, but when you find like a boss is also in, uh, involved in the, you know, they call it teasing, they call it teasing an autistic. 
it, it doesn't go well because at the end of the day you, why are you teasing me on something that you know I'm going to get mad about or something I'm going to get uncomfortable uh, with because suddenly you're, you're taking tea and you're with your colleagues and you're like I don't think this is a safe space because I don't know suddenly which topic they're going to bring up that is going to involve Anne as an artistic that is going to make you uncomfortable or make you mad and they're going to watch and see if you're reacting negatively to whatever is going on I'll say uh, keep off keep off harassing keep off harassing and workplaces like the HR department can can look into how to protect the rights of uh, of autistics and people with disability in the workplace because you can yeah you, you can get reports yeah you can get reports especially when it gets to uh, an overwhelming level you can go and report and say uh, I don't like what the department of this and this is doing to me or a specific employee so some an action should be taken we need to be protected like uh, other employees are protected so as we as we are marking the World Autism Day let us um, let us just sit back and say what have we been doing to this autistics all this time why not adjust why not include them they have, they have been born autistic that nothing they did they just got here and got here autistic yeah I see people trying to cure us and doing other things which will not will not work will not work yeah people might need medication for say like ADHD someone might need uh, medication to to ease uh, to ease a few difficulties if it's autism someone might need uh, medication maybe for anxiety things like that yeah but we can't cure autism once autistic you're you're an autistic yeah um, to the rest of the autistics I'll say uh, it's time to also believe in ourselves it's time to believe in ourselves if you have a job uh, that you need inclusion you need accommodation for you can approach the HR and you can ask for the uh, specific accommodations you need and, and I'm sure they'll listen to you either you'll get one or two or probably even everything they're really good places to uh, to work they're really good places to work and I think we, we can do more than we thought we couldn't we couldn't do because as the world gets tougher they say also that the, the tough get get going I have my book out the rest of the story uh, that I, about how my life has been, how terrible and the good things along the way. It's been written down in a me memoir called Enough of Being an Alien. Thank you for your time and I hope this will be a different every uh, for the autistics as well.